Good morning and welcome to the Life Risk Management webcast. I'm Elspeth Bowler of the Life Risk Management Group and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. We have some excellent sessions lined up on topics that we're, we're certain are top of mind given the ter current environment. Rather than delay our life risk management seminar when, until we could meet in person, we opted to do it via webcast so that we could have timely discussions. We have been heartened by the, by the positive response that we've had. I also want to acknowledge and thank, on behalf of OSFI, our frontline workers and those providing essential services. Before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping uh, notes. It, you can submit questions at any time through the question box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Please specify which presenter you would like the questions directed to. We'll, we will answer the questions after each session, and if we don't have time to run answer all of them, we, we, we will send answers the, re, the remaining answers out via email in the coming days. To get simultaneous French translation, you can click on the Francais button at the top right-hand corner of your screen. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Neville Henderson, Assistant Superintendent of the Insurance Supervision Sector, to give the opening remarks. Neville? Thanks, Elspeth, and good morning, everybody. And thanks for, thanks for participating today. I'm sure you all have so many unanticipated obligations that uh, come with this current environment. It certainly has become a very challenging time, uh, but leading into the pandemic, there were growing challenges in the industry in any case. At my last public speaking event in December, at least my last one in, in Canada, I spoke about some of the major risks facing the industry, such as IFRS 17 implementation, anticipated marketing, market correction volatility, uh, climate change, digitalization, cyber risk, demographic changes, and strategic changes. All of these have now been magnified by COVID-19. It's really acted as an accelerant on a number of these issues. All of this is in addition to the many issues the industry is already facing, such as international changes in capital, uh, reinsurance changes, um, and, and, and general marketing changes uh, right across uh, uh, their, their marketing environment. We're working towards addressing those risks, both on a regulatory and supervisory basis. And I know you are working diligently on many of them from the business side. COVID has not made any of them disappear and it certainly disrupted our plans. In fact, many of the risks and issues we identified have become far more impactful. COVID has introduced new claims risks, which are more impactful on specific product types but the impact on the markets, operations, digitalization, and company strategies has really been dramatic and, and we see it growing in the future. As we go through the sessions today, you're gonna to hear from a wide range of experts on where we are, uh, where we are going, and our plan on how to get where we need to be going forward. These in sessions and your engagement in them are critical in finding a way forward. So I'm looking forward to openly sharing our approach on the issues that will shape the future. Certainly thank you and, and uh, trust you will find the sessions today both informative and helpful and we encourage you strongly to ask questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Neville. And now it's time for our discussion on the post-COVID-19 world. I'd like to welcome David Officer, Life Insurance Consulting Leader and Associate Partner of Ernst & Young, Bruce Langstroth, Associate Partner and Canadian Life Actuarial Leader from Ernst & Young, Tom McKinnon, Managing Director of BMO Capital Markets, and Stephen Wright, Managing Director of OSFI's Risk Surveillance and Sector Oversight Group. And now I'll turn it over to David. Perfect, thanks very much, Elspeth. Good morning, everybody. I am indeed David Officer, and I lead the, uh, the Life and Group Insurance Consulting Practice here at EY, uh, based in Toronto. And uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Um, I, I don't want to be another in a long line of people saying these are unprecedented times or difficult times, but because it seems trivializing to say it, but uh, the effects of COVID-19 have clearly been disruptive, right, to, to many of our lives. And I'm sure a number of us on this call have been personally impacted, be it through friends or family who've been touched. So uh, just, just wanted to, to start and 
uh, frame it that way. Um, likewise, though, the business environment's been significantly impacted. So, uh, and our industry, the life insurance industry, has not been immune. So the effects are, are really broad reaching and they're touching the entire value chain. Um, so for the next, next 15 minutes or so, my colleague Bruce, Bruce Langstroth and I are going to speak uh, about what we're seeing across the industry uh, in Canada. And we're also going to tie uh, a few uh, few learnings that we've pulled from, uh, from around the world. Uh, and we're going to speak to to what we're seeing is the impact that have already occurred, but also we're going to focus on what's next and, and beyond uh, is sort of a framework that we're applying. And cert certainly, I think the immediate priority for most insurers when, when we, we began this, this sort of lockdown um, has been business continuity, right? Primarily focusing on the immediate needs of their workforce and customers and paired with efforts around uh, operational resilience. Where we're at now is, is quite a bit different. So we're beginning to see a shift into uh, acceleration of a number of programs. Um, we're also seeing other programs being deprioritized uh, across operations, across some of the people initiatives, and, and across technology as well. So, so for the next few minutes, Bruce and I are primarily going to focus on the operational impacts and trends, and then, uh, then I'll wrap uh, speaking a little bit about some of the, the people and technology implications as well. With that, uh, Bruce, over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, perhaps we can skip to, I think, two slides. Next one. Um, I, I, I think it's David and, and, no, no, one before, please. Thank you. Uh, as David has, has touched on and Neville touched on in, in his introduction, uh, you know, we, we've been involved in, in, in this pandemic for, for three months or more. And we've already seen a, a number of significant impacts uh, on, on how insurance companies conduct their, their business uh, and, and on how uh, the, the employees uh, of those organizations are, are living their lives and, and uh, uh, working on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I want to try to, to consolidate what, what's on this slide in, into to maybe uh, three themes. Uh, one and a very important one is, is the disruption that, that uh, uh, the pandemic ha has caused for, for employees and their lives, uh, which, which then spills into the, to the insurance companies themselves and, and uh, uh, how those individuals are able to, to work on a day-to-day -day basis, in, in some cases uh, uh, presenting productivity challenges, uh, uh, connection challenges and so on and so forth. The good news is, is that for, for most of the industry in Canada and for for most uh, for for much of the world, uh, we we mostly weathered that that problem. Not that it's one that organizations and, and employees won't want to deal with with you know on a permanent basis, but but certainly. Uh, we have found ourselves re reasonably able to accommodate and, and, and uh, uh, deal with the challenges presented from, from working remotely. The second uh, theme really is, is an operational perspective. And, and in particular, parts of, of insurance companies' operations that require face-to-face -face or, or, or close-to-face-to-face -to -face com contact in, in order to work. And these are places that, that perhaps have, have been more disrupted uh, than others. And, and I think in particular, but, but sales processes, uh, companies that, that, that distribute through, through uh, uh, brokers and other distributors that, that, that uh, have historically sold business face-to-face, uh, -face obviously, are, are challenged in this environment. Uh, another place in which we, we've seen disruptions is, is in the claims management side. Uh, disability in particular, where, where the pandemic and, and quarantining and social distancing presents challenges to, to uh, see doctors and other healthcare providers. And, and of course, with, with the companies that, that are, are quarantined and, and are everybody working from home, there are challenges in getting people back to work. Lastly, of course, uh, we, we've seen market impacts. 
a fairly significant uh, uh, market decline in, at the end of the first quarter, uh, drops in, in risk-free rates, increases in, in, in credit spreads. And, and since that time, uh, while, while there's been a rebound in the market, there, there's been increased volatility uh, and, and the challenges that that, that will present to, to the industry in, in managing and dealing with that. Uh, the good news, of course, is, is that the, the Canadian industry ha, has weathered that challenge to date, and, and uh, hopefully they continue to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So for, from a, a kind of looking forward perspective, uh, there, there are a number of items on, on this slide. I, I wanted to pull out two or three of these, these in particular. Uh, one, obviously, as companies look forward, uh, questions of pricing and product design will, will be front and center uh, for, for insurance companies. Um, the question of how, how does uh, the pandemic and its impacts on mortality, both in, in terms of, of immediate impacts and in terms of, of framing perspectives around future mortality and future mortality improvement will be ones that companies will, will be thinking about as we move, move forward. Uh, as well, product design questions around uh, products that with, with long-term guarantees that, that, that may uh, unduly restrict organizations' abilities to, to uh, adapt and accommodate uh, uh, events in the marketplace will, will also be, be uh, a focus of attention. Uh, the, the second thing that I wanted to draw was, was on risk, and in particular with, with respect to, to stress testing. Uh, clearly, uh, stress testing is, is a challenging exercise, uh, one that has a tendency sometimes to fall back on, on historic patterns and, and, and historic events to, to frame testing. And, and one of the things that, that we keep learning is, is that every event tends to turn out in, in somewhat unique ways. And, and, and organizations will, will want to, to think about and explore how, how they can adapt uh, and, and extend events that we've seen to, to contemplate things that might happen. Lastly, uh, on, on plain side, uh, clearly organizations will need to think about, about certain parts of their claims management to organizations uh, and, and how they approach claims management. I, I think in particular about disability management, which I've already touched on, where it, it's a high touch function and is difficult to, to uh, conduct in, in, in an environment like this. And organizations will, will certainly want to think about how, how they can uh, adapt and, and plan for potential uh, events like this in the future. So, David, over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, if we can move forward a slide. So, so just I'll, I'll quickly touch on on each of these topics, right? If we if we first look to sales distribution and, and underwriting, um, you know, we're we're at a stage now where where regions across the country are are reopening, if you will, but the risk of resurgence of uh, of cases remains, and it's likely that uh, limited and reduced face-to-face -face interactions are going to be necessary for many months. And, uh, and we see most, uh, uh, most if not all, uh, carriers recognizing that um, and, and responding to it. Um, I, I, think, I think what's, what's noteworthy here, though, is the interaction with, with policyholders and, and uh, uh, has fundamentally changed, right? And, and self-service engagement has dramatically increased. Uh, and frankly, we don't see this changing back, right? So that's going to be the, the, the way things are, are going forward um, with obviously uh, there's going to be a, an initial uptick of, of people really wanting to see other people uh, coming back. So, so um, what, what we anticipate happening is the distribu distribution model is going to continue to adapt and improve um, interactions via phone and video and, and other online channels. And uh, what, we're, what we're starting to, to discuss is the potential for material cost savings and, and broader reach for, uh, for those that can capitalize on that. Um, part, part of the, the, the more tactical thing that we're seeing is 
uh, an acceleration of programs around uh, automation. So whether it's uh, you know your robotics uh, process automation type automation or virtual assistants uh, assisted by AI, these technologies uh, adoption rates are actually in accelerating, and we're seeing a lot of those programs um, increase. Um, we, we haven't seen seen much movement on this yet, but we're having a number of conversations around uh, increased interest in modernization of all the digital sales tools, right? Both for interactions with, with MGAs and brokers, but also clients directly. And, and we anticipate that that will continue to increase as well. Um, and just the broader trend of digitization is going to be a big one in sales distribution underwriting going forward. In terms of the processing and, and support, functions. Um, speed is key here. Um, so speed is key to managing customer satisfaction and reputational risk. Um, but the shift to online uh, has really increased the conversation around potential cyber exposure. Um, so, so insurers are, are, are really increasing their investment into cybersecurity and uh, they're doing a lot more continuous monitoring of, uh, of cyber and they're reviewing controls and monitoring security frameworks much more aggressively. And, and we don't, again, that's another area that we don't anticipate that declining. We, we expect to see that, uh, that only increasing. Um, now, the, I'll, I'll reiterate a point I made in, in the, the previous section, but but this is another area of significant opportunity around automation. So RPA and, and AI and similar approaches. Um, when, when we talk to our centers of excellence, um, there's a surge in demand uh, to those groups and we're getting more and more uh, digitized throughout the, uh, the chain. Uh, we don't see that uh, declining in, in any way, so we see that only increasing. But we we think what's going to be more interesting there is as everything is digitized, there's going to be a lot more opportunity uh, to apply advanced analytics capabilities. All right, I'm just looking at time, so I'm going to keep moving. So on the uh, the policy side, uh, policy admin side, sorry, uh, I'll quickly cover this. Um, clearly, job loss is, is at, uh, at pretty high levels, even, even as we're starting to recover, right? So, so there's been a lot of talk about deferring premium payments. Um, there's been a lot of additional customer inquiries around policy deferrals and withdrawals. Um, I haven't seen much tangibly on this, but uh, I've heard anecdotally about uh, annuity surrenders uh, as, uh, as an area of, of risk as well. Um, what we've seen in terms of additional reactions has been a shift in uh, expanding hours to spread out call volumes and, uh, and a push to, to get these sort of inquiries to other channels. Very, very straightforward. Um, in the longer, in the midterm and, and beyond, what we see more is uh, continuing to expand those sales service capabilities for high volume and routine transactions. Uh, and then, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, a much greater emphasis on analytics as uh, more process uh, process and data becomes digitized. So now if we can move to the, the next slide. Um, so I'll just really quickly touch on sort of the broader people and technology implications. So on, on the people side, obviously everyone is lives in, in uh, the same same society, uh, if you will. So, so the impact on people uh, has been significant, right? But, as Bruce alluded to, though, the shift to remote work has largely been very effective, um, at least in my conversations with insurers. And, and most are recognizing that remote work is going to become more of the rule rather than the exception. Um, and so and we're, we're seeing that with policy changes. We're seeing it with some public announcements from a number of FIs. Um, but, uh, but again, I think, I think there's a lot of implications there. So. Uh, one is that these collaboration tools that we're even using right now have become second nature to most of us, and they're they're actually continuing to evolve and improve as we use them. And I think that's only going to make uh, make work and collaboration more possible and better. Um, the the one one challenge that I do want to raise on the people side that I've heard uh, a lot is uh, is one of the biggest concerns is how to maintain a cohesive post uh, corporate culture while the population is remote, particularly as you onboard new people. Um, so I think this is going to be an ongoing discussion. We're discussing uh, with our clients a variety of approaches to deal with it, from you know, better ice-breaking approaches to mentoring to affinity groups through corporate social media. All of those are going to be tactics that are used. Um, 
And then, then on the technology side, I'll just reiterate some of the points I've already made, right? So digital transformation efforts are accelerating um, and they're being reprioritized, typically moved forward in priority. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot of effort um, uh, and work completed around call center virtualization and automation. And automation. Uh, we've seen back office RPA and, uh, and we, see, uh, we see now the goals are starting to shift to sort of stay afloat to becoming how do we increase engagement and reduce uh, operational costs. Uh, the, other, the other point I wanted to make is we are seeing more emphasis on, or interest at least, in direct-to-consumer um, connections. So whether that's direct-to-consumer sales, um, some we're seeing, but a lot of it is just around servicing. Um, but we are starting to see an increased interest in direct-to-consumer. So with that, because I'm a minute over time, I, I recognize that uh, Bruce and I just did a whirlwind tour, but but hopefully you have a, a sense for what's happening in the market. I'm hoping this validated a lot of what you're seeing uh, and uh, ideally provided you with some other considerations to think about. So thanks a lot for your time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tom McKinnon from Demo to continue the conversation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Morning, everyone. Delighted to speak at this uh, seminar here. I want to take it from the perspective of, uh, of an insurance analyst. Uh, I've been covering insurance stocks here for over 20 years at uh, um, in Canada, both the life and the PNC, as well as the uh, asset managers and diversified financials. So uh, um, I'm an actuary as well. And prior to uh, moving over to become a, a sell side analyst, uh, I worked at uh, um, in the life insurance industry in Canada, both at a consulting firm and prior to that at a, uh, a large uh, a Canadian life co. So we'll just move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is sort of the uh, overview of my presentation. Uh, I want to look at it just from uh, an equity analyst perspective of what the current challenges are and what we've learned uh, in the to go forward in the post-COVID-19 environment, and also talk about uh, the digitization of the consumer here, which is a really important uh, feature, and I think a lot of investment is going into digitization efforts, uh, both in terms of distribution and at the consumer end as well. So into the next slide, please. Uh, so if we're going to look at the current challenges, um, obviously there's an impact on claims, but uh, um, I, I don't see that as, uh, as, as large as the potential impact on credit and then the macro impacts as a result of you know, interest rates and equity markets changing a lot of volatility with respect to them. And those can uh, obviously have an impact on the life coast. So I'm going to take each one of those uh, in uh, a little bit more detail as we move forward here. So if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, if we look at the changes uh, of interest rates and equity markets, uh, if we want to, the best thing we can do here and what investors are concerned about is this, is this going to be, how does this look relative to the, you know, the, the global financial crisis we had in 2008 and 2009? And uh, the capital positions are significantly stronger than they were then. Uh, if we want to look at, uh, you know, excess capital, if we want to just define it as what you have over the uh, supervisory target, uh, certainly in terms of dollar amounts, uh, even per share amounts, significantly higher. And the companies are uh, tend to be less leveraged as well. And more importantly, the sensitivity of their swings in interest rates and equity markets is significantly less. Uh, there's much better hedging in terms of any of the uh, segregated fund or variable annuity businesses. Um, they've uh, done a better job in terms of cash flow matching long tail business. There's much more par where uh, the sensitivity is less and probably most of the, the mix of the business has changed as well. So we did see even uh, um, the testament to that was in the first quarter of 2020 when we saw the LICAT ratios and the book value per share actually increase quarter over quarter for the life goes despite a 20% decline in equity markets and 130 basis point drop in the U.S. 10-year uh, treasury yields. So I think that's uh, proof there that uh, um, we've got some pretty good resiliency. Uh, if you look back in 2008 and 2009, if you could have just blown on these cap capital ratios, the MCCSR ratio with a you know 50-point drop in interest rates and 20% decline in equity markets, and it, it it really took a fair chunk out of the excess capital back then. So much more resilient in that perspective. Uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, what we've done here, just for the large Canadian life codes, we've plotted um, 
the blue bar, which is sort of what your capital would be of above the supervisory target. And then the yellow is sort of your, uh, your leverage capacity. So if you're above 20 Five percent leverage. That's debt plus pressed total capital. That yellow bar would be below zero, and if you're under, that uh, yellow bar is uh, in above zero. And you can see how well the uh, excess capital positions for these things have significantly moved since then. Uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, if we look at the impact of the book, or, uh, sorry about that ring there. We'll get that off in a second. Uh, in terms of the impact on book value. Uh, swings to interest rates and equity markets. We can see here the same kind of positioning here. Uh, uh, back then, in terms of book value per share, uh, 50 basis point decline in interest rates and a 10% decline in equity markets would hurt these companies by their book value per share by 5%. That's the large Canadian life goes. And now you can see it's less than 1%. So, you know, even if we wanted to quantify the impact on the book for getting the excess capital, these things are, these comp these large Canadian life goes are significantly less, less sensitive to swings in interest rates and equity markets. And I think it's important that uh, investors in these companies realize that you can't go buy that 2008 playbook, um, yeah, that uh, the landscape and the sensitivity has changed significantly since then. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, in terms of the impact on credit, um, this one's hard to gauge. I don't think we're going to see the impact for some time now. Um, you know, I think some people ask, how does it compare to the 2008, 2009 global fin financial crisis? Uh, obviously, back then you had some fallen angels, uh, you know, good investment grade credits that fell, fell to zero, you know, Lehman, Wachovia, AIG, Washington Mutual. And uh, obviously, with Life Co's being primarily invested in bonds, uh, you know you can see that uh, they would have taken significant hits. Uh, one thing we did in this as a stress test is just look at if we that back then about eight percent of all the financial bonds essentially became worthless. So if we just did eight percent of all the consumer bonds or eight percent of all the energy bonds. Uh, you know, the LICAT hit would be three to four points, which is quite manageable. But as I said, uh, we, we won't know the outcome for some time. Uh, I think they're more susceptible just to downgrades as opposed to fallen angels. And, and we're also keeping an eye on the real estate portfolios as well uh, to see what impact any kind of declines in the market values of those would be. Um, I would add, though, that uh, a large chunk of the uh, commercial real estate that these guys have, which is not a significant portion of their investment portfolio, um, does support uh, par liabilities. And there's some pass through mechanisms here that uh, wouldn't hurt the LICAT as much associated with that. Uh, to the next slide, please. If we look at the impacts on, on sales, we saw first quarter sales were, were pretty resilient up nicely. Now, we didn't have the full impact, but I would add for companies that had Asian exposure, uh, they were well into COVID-19 in the first quarter. Uh, in terms of what the companies have disclosed so far, uh, we've just seen flat to modestly down sales in April. Uh, and, and we did note that uh, um, post SARS, we saw a significant spike in sales in Asia. So uh, it does make people, make people aware, if you will, of their uh, mortality or their morbidity. So we could see uh, post this uh, a bit of a lift up in sales. Uh, you know, from what I've heard from advisors is that uh, uh, this is, they're actually more productive in this environment than they can, they can go before in terms of visiting clients. It was, uh, um, you know, you didn't get as many visits a day, parking, moving around, et cetera. Now, when if you can just do that on Zoom or, or webcast or just discussions on phones, uh, it's uh, um, I think they find themselves to be more productive that way. So um, uh, that's uh, anecdotally what we're hearing with respect to sales. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, impact on claims. Uh, it's fairly modest here. If we had 100,000 deaths, you know, it's, uh, as they say, in the U.S., that's three and a half percent of annual mortality. Two hundred percent is seven percent. We do get some benefits in the annuity book, and um, uh, you know, as and and probably from the long-term care books, that mortality doesn't increase. But we are keeping an eye on long-term disability claims. Uh, see how uh, and any kind of anti-selection as the uh, as unemployment increases with respect to that. Uh, next slide, then, please. Uh, and so what have we learned? We've learned that you've got to have a strong capital position. You've got to be able to uh, 
uh, be deleveraged. Uh, I think the fact that they've taken these leverage ratios down below 25% means that, uh, um, you know, it's not that bad to try to increase your leveraging it as you move into this environment. So uh, being a strong capital position has been uh, very good. Uh, I think from what we've learned, there's been a relatively seamless transition to working from home for the insurance companies and for the distribution mechanisms of these insurance companies as well. And that's important. And just uh, digitization is becoming increasingly important. So if we just move to the next slide then, please. Yeah, if we look at uh, digitization of the consumer, you know, obviously uh, this is an emerging trend. So I think one of the guy, one of the things is going to be you have to have the scale and the size to be able to significantly invest in all your digitization plat, uh, digitization across your company and your distribution platforms. Uh, I think sometimes the companies with Asia might be a little bit ahead of the. Uh, um, uh, of North America in that regard, we've seen uh, um, uh, we've seen them ahead, and I think companies with those platforms in, in Asia can can leverage their capabilities globally in that regard as well. So, uh, um, you know, in terms of working more simplified underwriting processes, is going to help as well. Uh, E-signatures uh, um, and those are going to help as well. So um, that concludes my uh, my comments. I'm going to pass it over to Stephen right now, please. Thanks. So, uh, hi, I'm Steve Wright from uh, OSFI, and I'm going to take a few minutes to outline some high-level observations of what worked well at Furphy's responding to the COVID-19 crisis. So, a crisis can present both positive and negative experiences. None of us wish for a, a crisis to occur, but, uh, you know, certainly when they do, lessons can be learned. Systems have failed, reports weren't available, or the data didn't exist. Uh, investments went south and liquidity dried up. In spite of all of that, your companies remained viable and some processes and tactics have actually worked extremely well in spite of everything that's going on around us. Uh, so what we did for this exercise today is we gathered information from both the insurance and a banking perspective, because a lot of there, there was a lot of common issues across both. And we broke down these uh, issues into financial, non-financial, a number of other issues. So on the financial risk side, um, companies that did best uh, were those that started analyzing vulnerable sectors, products, exposures early on. They recognized the scale and the materiality of the vulnerabilities at the same pace or ideally faster than their peers. Uh, they were able to conduct uh, deep dives into the areas of higher vulnerability and they repeated this as conditions changed. All of this supported early mitigation of risks. Um, also, a number of the companies, in fact, most had already adapted some to some of the lessons learned from prior risk events, like the global financial crisis, but also some more recent events like the repo market disruption last fall, um, where we saw stress testing conducted, it was focused, and we also saw uh, sensitivity testing play a key role, uh, but it was important that it was selective due to scarce resources. And when they were when they were doing that, they were testing, adjusting, and then they were repeating that again. Also, we didn't see them overanalyze the situation. Um, heading into the crisis, I think a strong financial position was extremely important um, from a capital earnings liquidity perspective, and that really provided more flexibility and time to act. And similarly for the subs and branches, clear evidence of parent support early on. Uh, whether it was needed or not was important to provide that flexibility. Uh, next slide. In respect to BCPs, um, you know, overall, we saw pretty good operational resilience. Institutions had previously tested and adapted uh, their approaches. Um, and, and the best really had a very quick pivot to uh, work from home. In this case, moving fast uh, allowed these institutions to be able to test and adapt before it became a requirement as we know from the government in many cases. Um, prior BCP testing included a pandemic, but uh, certainly we didn't see anything anywhere near as severe as what we're experiencing now. Um, in regards to staff, uh, institutions uh, that were able to repurpose staff worked well, well, very well, but um, if it, as long as it wasn't at the expense of the second line. Um, additionally, in response to staff, they were able to track and report on staff impacts of the situation, whether that was absenteeism, illness, availability, and skills, and other key metrics as well. 
But overall, I think it was important that you know we saw all these contribute to the maintenance of key critical services. Uh, next slide. So on the non-financial risk side, uh, the institutions, you know, the investments obviously had a operational plan in place. They had tested their operational capacity for disruption. Uh, it had already been practiced and the continuity of critical operations was arrived at in short order. The second line was already starting to consider new risks that might emerge or existing ones that might change in the situation. And when they did have areas of concern, they conducted deep dives into those areas like third and fourth party vendors, supply chains, and they had backup capability already established for those, in particular outsourced operations, and they could switch to an alternate provider, whether it's in-house, Canada, or other location. From a customer service perspective, I think the two words that describe this best were the nimble and responsive, and it re evolved with the situation. Um, strong service resiliency was carried through. So uh, strong business as usual controls were equal, equally effective in the crisis and from a work from home environment. And uh, lastly, they had a plan in place to manage potential reputational risks. Um, when you look at data management and technology, the benefits of long-term investments in these were clearly evident. And uh, that related to companies that em also employed a digital strategy, uh, really putting them at a clear advantage. And you heard some examples in the earlier presentations of that. And really the ab ability to pivot and accelerate those efforts as this played out over a longer time period. Um, those, those IT capabilities really improved their ability to produce timely, accurate data that was scalable and really confirmed that it's almost impossible to create new data in the middle of a crisis. Um, they were able to adapt the system to the new norm and, and including the work from home environment. Uh, as well, they were also able to use the current situation to move customers online where costs are much lower. Next slide. From a reporting perspective, I, th I think the important thing was that the gravity of the situation was recognized early on and the institution was switched to new reporting and structured reporting almost immediately. Uh, it was succinct and informative and continued to adapt as the situation evolved. And again, reflecting those strong data capabilities. What stands out was the depth and the breadth of reporting, especially with respect to sensitivity testing and the impacts on earnings and capital. Um, that reporting was of equal value to senior management board and OSFI. You didn't have to produce three different reports. You had one report that met all three needs. And, it, and I think critically, it balanced the, the need for detail versus timeliness, which really does affect how an institution responds to what's found through that work. And again, just to reiterate, uh, quality was directly tied to IT capabilities. When we looked at communications, the key attribute was senior management involvement on a regular frequency. It was clear, open discussion and dialogue with staff. It was adaptive. It adjusted quickly to new issues and concern, and it continued to maintain a positive can-do attitude to really help move the organization forward. And all of this was made easier because communication strategies were already in place before the crisis occurred. So just to finish off with senior management and board, uh, senior management and board were engaged early in the process, but were careful not to let management continue to do their job. They really pivoted to a structured approach that really became the new normal. Um, senior management was very proactive in steps to mitigate the risk on the horizon. They didn't assume that there's going to be a market recovery. They more so looked at this is the new norm and this is what we're going to have to work in going forward. They set clear milestones to address the evolving situation and they pushed through operational uh, wins. They didn't dwell on the disaster itself. And they also looked for opportunities to leverage the situation. And again, we heard a few times accelerating digitalization strategy and also uh, work from home efforts. And lastly, they remained calm and positive throughout the crisis. They really set the tone for how the organization responds. Uh, that's it for me and I'll pass it back to Elspeth. Thank you, Stephen. And now um, let's see if we've received any questions from our viewers. Have we got any questions there? Just waiting. I think they're just gathering, uh, gathering the questions from the uh, online. 
Um, yes, we have a question. The uh, question is for ENY. Based on what ENY has seen to date, what can companies learn from COVID-19 and do differently in the future? Bruce, did you want to go first or would you like me to cover? I'll, I'll make a, a comment. You, you know, there, there's probably a, a long list of, of things that uh, one could come away from this with. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll offer one up that, that ties in with, with, with my earlier comments, with, which is really around, uh, you know, some collection of stress testing, uh, uh, business continuity planning, uh, re resilience, uh, operational resilience. And, and you know, there, there, I, I remember uh, back in 9-11 when, uh, I, I, after uh, the the, the secure airport security organizations uh, uh, kind of started thinking through how they were going to to live in the in the new world, they, they started uh, having everybody take off their shoes because somebody had tried to to smuggle on uh, explosives in, in, in their shoes. And, and I, I happened to read at the same time uh, an article talking about how Israeli security dealt with uh, uh, air, airport security. And, and it, was, it was a very different perspective because what Israeli airport security did was trying to think about the, the future and what might happen as opposed to what had been done before. And, and I think uh, as organizations look forward, I, I think they need to evolve their stress testing and, uh, and business continuity planning and, and operational resilience rather than a, a backward looking, you, you, we, we have something that covers A, B, and C, which have happened before, you know, thinking more forward looking and saying what might happen and, 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 and can we deal with that? And, a, and, and, and secondly, is our organizational organization resilient enough to adapt to a scenario that may be different than what we had planned for. So, so from a financial perspective, risk management perspective, I, I think that's one of the places that, that, uh, that, that may change going forward. David? I'll, I'll keep mine short and sweet. I, I, I would say uh, this, this industry has not been known for being uh, pioneers and early early adopters of, of new technologies. Um, I would say the acceleration that we're seeing around digitization efforts um, is is a clear indicator and uh, likely a lesson that uh, perhaps uh, perhaps you shouldn't be delayed as much as they have been uh, traditionally. And I'll, I'll just sort of leave it at that just because of time. Okay. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Were there any other questions? Uh, there is one question. Uh, where do you think we are in the crisis? Still at the beginning, at the end, or somewhere in the middle? And why don't we uh, have uh, uh, Bruce and David take that? So, okay. I, so, so, I, I guess my answer would be in the middle. Uh, I, I mean, certainly we, we, we've gone. I, I think we've gone beyond the beginning. Uh, and, and while I might want to be optimistic and say we're approaching the end, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I would go out and really say that. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I'll answer a slightly different question. Um, I, I would say the response is past the beginning. And I, and I think we're, we're now into the more uh, strategic decision-making portion of the, the insurance carrier's responses, which is now they're starting to think, okay, what if this comes back or what if something else similar happens? How do we better prepare ourselves for that? And, and really that's, that's what uh, Bruce and I were both speaking about in, in our session, session. Okay. And Tom, did you have anything to add to what they've just said? Yeah, one thing I'd probably say is the market seems to, uh, if you look at where equity markets are, uh, they're uh, um, you know, really not that much different than they were at the start of the year. So to some extent, there's a bit of separation between what uh, the stock market's doing and what the general economy is doing in, in terms of uh, 
where levels of the S&P 500 are versus where levels of unemployment are. Uh, you know, I, I think clearly what, you know, there's winners and losers and it's really who's going to be able to adapt best in the uh, sort of a post COVID uh, environment. Uh, you know, you get, it's airlines and hotels. Uh, I mean, they're suffering, but if you're in the, uh, any kind of delivery or courier type business, you're winning. So I, I think, uh, um, uh, the market's suggesting that uh, it's moving towards a new economy. It's probably moving towards a, uh, a lower for longer interest rate environment. But I would uh, I would say we are being helped with lots of liquidity uh, provided by uh, um, you know by the Fed and by uh, um, by the government here. And we'll we'll have to really see from an economic perspective how things are going to play out. Sort of once that uh, that free money and ample liquidity kind of runs out. So. Uh, um, I'd say from an economic perspective, uh, the market is hopeful, uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to have to see how things turn out in the fall when some of that uh, liquidity perhaps uh, changes a little bit. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Thanks to our panel for an interesting discussion. And now um, we're going to be moving on to operational risk reimagined. I'd like to introduce Catherine McPherson, Senior Manager, National Non-Financial Risk Leader at Ernst & Young, and Tracy Lawfer, Director in our Operational Risk Division. And now I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thanks very much, Elspeth. Uh, Thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and and talk to you about what we're seeing um, happening during the COVID. The the focus of my presentation is really going to be around like what needs to happen in the next stages. How does operational risk management as a function and as a program, as a construct within your organizations need to be, um, how how does it need to evolve in order to keep pace with uh, the changes and the risks that we're going to be seeing moving through uh, the pandemic and into the post COVID environment. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, Basically, we we recognize that a lot of effort and a lot of progress has been made uh, in the life insurance industry in standing up their robust operational risk management uh, functions in the last 10 years. Uh, Definitely in the last six, seven years, we've seen um, a, a move where it's not just focusing on the second line operational risk management programs, but embedding the programs within the lines of business through the evolution of 1B functions. And this type of um, this type of uh, progress is going to continue to, to, to need to happen on a go-forward basis and pushing uh, the operational risk management programs to be much more holistic and integrated um, in the post-COVID environment. So if we move to the next slide. Here, what we're, we're, we're key message that we want to drive home here is that um, in everything that you're doing, whether it's the the going through the, the pandemic right now and, and through the early stages of the of the response uh, to the pandemic, moving into the next phase of sustainability in your response, and as uh, David uh, and Bruce mentioned, having you know making strategic decisions in terms of what needs to change on a go forward. We want to, you should be taking a structured approach to uh, really focus on the unexpected. So in everything that you're doing um, in your operational risk management programs, whether it's evaluating uh, your third party risks and exposures and understanding uh, what new risks are emerging um, from the work from home environment and the reliance on technology, you really need to be in the backdrop uh, leading, le- leading with this view of we should be expecting the unexpected. So I think most organizations have successfully moved through the solve the now phase of, of the uh, crisis. They, we saw, as, as Stephen mentioned, there's been uh, good responses in terms of uh, prior work that had been done before the, the crisis, understanding what those risks are, um, the scenario analysis and business continuity plans have been put in place to uh, consider the pandemic scenario. Obviously, I don't think anyone had included in their pandemic plans um, th- such a, a 100% of their workforce working remotely um, and that it would be a global pandemic. Uh, certainly, we saw plans that addressed um, different waves coming, th- uh, different waves happening in stages where per- certain percentage of employees would be unavailable and that, you know, pandemic wouldn't necessarily be uh, global. But it's been very positive response in terms of seeing how most organizations have had an easy transition into that work from home environment and 
We see a lot of focus on um, employee health, well-being, and uh, making sure that the governance models and controls infrastructure is still operating as, as effectively as it should be. Um, as we move into the explore the next in the sustain and recover parts of the of the of the response to um, the the uh, pandemic, we see a need where. Uh, most, a lot of organizations have had to amend their governance processes to make to be more nimble, to be able to make uh, more decisions on a quicker basis, uh, use of more information and better data to be able to make some quick decisions. Um, obviously, moving into a remote environment, there have been some control impl implications and policy exceptions that have had to be granted. And so having the ability to have a very adaptable governance model where um, interim forums have been created to make those decisions, uh, but still maintain that, that level of governance that's required, a re transparency around the decisions that are being made, um, and, and ensuring that um, there's a high degree of transparency and visibility across the organization as decisions around policy exceptions are, are, being, are, are being introduced. Um, we also have seen uh, in the sustain and recover period that organizations still need to be mindful of any new operational risks that might be introduced through the new working environment. Um, certainly, in we see in wealth and uh, capital markets areas that uh, you know supervision of employees um, and, and use of personal devices. There's there's new risks that have emerged that need to be taken into consideration in the, in in terms of what is a sustainable model um, as we anticipate having this wor remote work from from home environment for at least several more months. Um, uh, if we're listening to to what most of our clients are saying, so. In the recovery phase, uh, we really need to start thinking strategically about well, like, what are those longer term impacts of the COVID-19? Uh, what new tech Technologies should be uh, used to help the management capabilities in this new environment. And organizations should also be thinking about their skill sets and the talent that's in some of these roles. As there's more reliance on, on the, and, and as the bank, the, the life insurance companies and banks are becoming more digitized, obviously there's more connectivity and reliance on, on technology. Um, what new skills would be required in operational risk management in order for or the risk management can continue to keep pace with changes that are happening in, in the business. Um, lastly, as you are thinking about these strategic uh, decisions from a long-term post-COVID uh, standpoint, we challenge organizations to really think about their governance and operating models um, and focus and, and as a foundational element, uh, really focus on building a strong culture. Uh, we, we've seen uh, anecdotally through a lot of the clients that we're be meeting with uh, that, that those organizations that have fared well, they have fared well, but there's been a lot of uh, individual heroics that have, have also um, uh, contributed to the success in in terms of the response to the pandemic, and so how does how does one, an organization ensure that they have the appropriate culture that's going to um, continuously be adaptable and um, share information and communicate effectively, so that whether there's this COVID nineteen pandemic or the next event that that unprecedented event that could hit the financial services industry, that your organization is um, has the culture that's required to enable that strong operational resiliency. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the transformation and, and um, you know, challenging organizations to really imagine beyond uh, what's currently being done in the, in the status quo is to think about how you're using data. Think about what data is required um, in order to be able to enable that nimble response, that seamless response and coordination across the enterprise uh, to, to drive the, the, the desired outcomes. If we can move to the next slide. So here we want to um, ask organizations to focus on culture rather than continuity planning. And this is not to say to, you know, don't, don't think about continuity planning, but what we've seen uh, through, our, through our work with our clients is that building a strong culture that stands the test of time really is um, the best control that you can have in terms of enabling an effective response. Leverage the data to accelerate a change to your culture. You want to be able to have visibility into um, the health of your organization's culture, particularly during a time like the pandemic. Um, you know, there's a human impact of working remotely and, and self-isolation. And so you want to have mechanisms that are in place 
that allow you to touch base on. So how how is how are people responding? How are people communicating and interacting with one another? And do we have the proper uh, mechanisms that are going to enable us to have that visibility um, of how our culture is impacting the risk profile on an ongoing basis? So we, we do challenge organizations to think about culture through a risk lens, um, and not so much as a risk culture, but more. Uh, about the adaptability and the um, and the uh, quickness, like how quickly and and can you mobilize your your whole enterprise to move in the same direction towards those positive outcomes? Can we move to the next slide? The next message here is about focusing more on resilience and not requirements. So traditionally, we see um, business continuity management programs have been pretty siloed in terms of their assessment of the business impact. And what we're seeing a trend um, definitely in the U.S. And, and starting to see it in some of the larger organizations here in Canada is that um, organizations are, are, are transforming from a like continuing business to being very resilience native. And that means thinking about um, operational resilience at the very earliest uh, point of the life cycle of product development, for example, of recruit recruitment of people, of uh, establishment and, and, and understanding of the business processes that the most critical business processes that are in your organization, and. Uh, one of the lessons that we see coming out of the, the, the COVID-19 crisis thus far is that those organizations who have invested in identifying and inventorying their most critical business services and mapping those business services and processes to their organizational assets, whether it be their systems and applications, data, crown jewels, um, talent, and uh, risks and controls, like they really had a, a much stronger visibility into what those upstream and downstream dependencies are. So if they see a problem in one area of their organization, um, it is a process that is um, having some type of vulnerabilities or difficulties, challenges, where they were invoking their plans, um, they really understand where else do we need to, um, where, where else do we need to deploy resources to, to really effectively and efficiently, um, you know, have a, a the most effective response uh, possible. Uh, as well, we want organizations to start thinking about the broader systemic impacts when um, developing individual business line continuity plans. Um, so the bigger picture here needs to be uh, the focus rather than the individual requirements of each business line in a silo. Can we move to the next slide? Here, we're, we're talking here about data primarily. Um, so most organizations have, uh, you know, definitely improved their data and analytical capabilities in the last uh, five to 10 years. And here, you know, post COVID is going to be even more important as everyone's working remotely and, um, and there's, you know, more disruption happening on a daily basis that there needs to be resilience measures that are explicitly embedded within the operational risk appetite framework. And these, these measures need to be very action oriented and forward looking. So, you know, I, I think I heard David say, rather than embedding within your uh, programs and your operational risk capabilities, uh, defenses against what's already happened. You really have to start challenging this, the, yourselves in terms of understanding like what could happen. Could there, during the pandemic, could there be a, like a, another disruption? Could there be um, another major event that happens simultaneously within the pandemic? And continuously assess the impact tolerance across your organization. Um, more testing is needed, uh, better testing, uh, more integrated testing is, is required in order to continue to evolve um, the, the program. And the assurance that's provided to senior management and the boards should really be based on um, data and evidence and, uh, and, and focus more on like what are the outcomes that we're uh, wanting to see and what is the evidence that we will be able to achieve those outcomes during, during a disruption. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned about outcomes, not process. So here what we're saying is in, from an operational risk standpoint, and definitely if we think about effective challenge programs that have been in place, um, there's been a lot of, of developments and progress uh, made where operational risk management is now being viewed as a, as a partner and they're in an advisory capacity to ensure that the, the decisions that are being made in the first line of defense, uh, that they're, they're, they're supported by reasonable um, rationale and, and support and evidence. Um, 
but there's a lot of focus in terms of demonstrating that 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 second line effectiveness on what is the process that we go through. And here, here we think that there needs to be a shift towards um, like what are the outcomes of that challenge? What are the outcomes of the operational risk management program? And really the challenge should be around whether or not those outcomes are demonstrating the ability to continue to be res- the continuance of being resilient and Um, you know, are really being clear about articulating what those desired outcomes in your operational risk management programs is going to go a long way in terms of driving what those uh, mechanisms are that that are used within the operational risk management program uh, to to be able to demonstrate that that the capabilities that are in place across the organization will will result in those outcomes. Um, We think there should be, you know, more broad communication of lessons learned across the pillars and domains. So uh, a lot of, um, there's been a lot of movement of like business continuity management, third party, cyber, kind of moving under operational risk management umbrella or within all under risk management under one executive over the last several years. However, we still see challenges in terms of there being still small silos that are um, in existence uh, within those 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 different programs. So we think that those silos need to come down and there needs to be uh, much broader communication of when uh, when when events of, like this are happening, that the sharing of the lessons learned, sharing of the good things that are working and the things that may not be working effectively, that, that, that needs to be codified in the uh, structure of the operational risk management program. So move to the next slide. So lastly, you know, if, if we think about the um, moving to the beyond COVID, like how, how it's always a challenge when you're trying to, to transform um, and evolve or enhance your, your organizational's operational risk management uh, program while still you know, business, running the business as usual um, activities. Um, and so we really encourage organizations to, to challenge themselves to, uh, especially on testing of their resilience and really push to the beyond of like, what, what is possible? What are those unexpected scenarios that, um, that, that we can imagine that, that, that might happen and really start to embed the lessons coming out of those testing and those scenario analysis into the design of the programs and into the design of the operational risk management mechanisms um, to, to really be able to respond effectively, not just today and tomorrow during COVID, but um, in the beyond uh, to, for the next unprecedented event that, that might hit our, our industry. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tracy. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and thank you for sharing your thoughts on operational risk management, its evolution. Uh, my name is Tracy Lawfer, and I am a director in the operational risk division here at OSFI. Um, I believe these discussions encourage the industry to look at operational risks in new ways, uh, which can further the industry's um, understanding and enhance all of our practices. So thanks for taking the time to join us today. Can we move to slide two? So I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to you on operational risk management and operational resilience at this point in time. Given the unprecedented global impacts to business, there certainly is a lot to think about and analyze. Going back to April 3rd of this year, I wanted to highlight a portion of the superintendent's statement on measures taken to support the resilience of financial institutions. Canadians can have confidence in our financial system during these current extraordinary times because it is resilient and well prepared. While much of what is happening now is clearly extraordinary, many of the challenges facing the financial system are elements that OSFI has been preparing for. I personally am proud of the supervision OSFI's operational risk division executed prior to the pandemic, as it contributes to our understanding of FERFI's risk management practices and their preparedness. Further, I see the work and buy-in across the Canadian financial industry in matters of operational risk management over the past few years. I have noted many dedicated professionals within the life insurance sector who recognize the value of operational risk management and the value it adds to an organization. This includes improving operations to help attain an organization's overall business objectives and financial results, as well as developing focused, future-looking risk views for financial risks by understanding the interconnections with operational risks. 
Through our supervision, OSFI has seen FERFIs building strong risk management capabilities. This has led them to understand risks and vulnerabilities, helped them build systems of internal control, and develop actions and plans to respond to potential events, such as what we're going through now. Next slide, please. Strong operational risk management can contribute to the reduction in the frequency and severity of operational risk events. This means unexpected losses, including those across financial risks, are reduced, ultimately contributing to financial strength and stability across the industry. So how does operational resilience relate to operational risk management? Popular definitions used focus on the ability of an institution to respond and recover their critical operations from disruptive events. Therefore, by promoting thought processes towards operational resilience, it is promoting the evaluation of the types of events that can have significant impact on operations, determining those critical operations, as well as the evaluation of capabilities that are needed within an organization. I'd like to highlight that these aren't new concepts. And although OSFI has not necessarily codified operational resilience in the past, we have been concerned about an institution's ability to respond and recover, which I will highlight using three aspects relevant to operational risk management. First is OSFI's supervisory framework, which is principles-based. We expect FERFIs to be forward-thinking as developments in the financial services industry change and the nature of the risks and risk management of financial institutions change. They must be prepared and adapt to these emerging scenarios. The next aspect is guideline E21 operational risk management, which is a foundational component to our risk supervision. It lays out our supervisory expectations in four principles, which is how OSFI approaches evaluation of operational risk management practices. FERFI's risk programs not only assess and identify risks, but include responses to risk events and their recovery plans. Terms such as business continuity and disaster recovery are often used, which are also specific points of review in OSFI's work. Finally, more recently, OSFI has placed enhanced focus on non-financial risks. Although this area is not new to our supervision, increased focus has been placed in areas where there is significant evolution and interest from the industry. This includes technology and culture. Next slide, please. So what's next? The financial industry needs to encourage all levels within their organizations to move from the check the box compliance behaviors when discussing operational risk management and thinks, think in terms of risk in their institution. In other words, not only setting up operational risk management practices and teams, but truly integrating operational risk management thinking across the organization. From our supervision, common themes or areas of improvement include the need to strengthen communications across departments and integrate work across departments, development of common operational risk taxonomies to be, to be used across an organization, and the integration of operational risk into the enterprise risk management programs. As mentioned, OSFI is building our supervision, supervision capabilities in non-financial risk to further engage the industry and provide deeper risk insights, specifically in two areas, technology with its fast-paced evolution and increasing integration across all areas of business, and culture, which can determine how effectively risk management programs are implemented. We are continuing to clarify our supervisory approach to operational resilience, and OSFI remains engaged with the international community in discussing operational resilience. Most notably with the Basel Commission, which is one of the leading organizations in moving definitions forward. 
Now, although the Basel Commission is concerned with banking, OSFI takes these opportunities to get international perspectives across different areas of the financial sector and bring the most applicable ideas back for all financial institutions in Canada. A holistic integrated approach to operational risk management will be even more important as the economy and business operations change and business interactions evolve. Discussion, discussing operational resilience can help educate staff and bring focus to business outcomes. By incorporating the topic of operational resilience, financial institutions may go beyond frameworks for operational risk management and integrate operational risk management practices across their organizations and ensure those practices are embedded. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I will now turn the presentation back over to Elspeth Bowler. Thank you, uh, Tracy and Catherine for some interesting uh, comments. Um, now um, let's see if we have any questions from our viewers. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Um, the first question is for Catherine. Can you give some examples of specific types of outcomes that you believe are most important to measure against? Sure, yeah, I, I think that um, when you're looking at the outcomes of um, like response times, if we're putting it in the context of resilience, it's really looking at setting your impact tolerance. So we want to be able to recover within this time period. We want to be able to um, maintain this level of service. And when you're testing, you want to make sure that the, the, the level of robustness of your tests are, are really pushing the boundaries in terms of what could happen. Um, so rather than, you know, I, I know that there's like lots of organizations that they would be doing testing and there might be uh, a few individuals who are participating in, in the testing of, of, of a system, for example, but pushing the boundaries of that test to, to, to be as real of a, of, of a simulation or as, as real of an event as possible by having um, the business process as well as the underlying systems that are enabling and including third parties, uh, critical third parties within that testing wherever that's possible, um, you'll really get a better sense of whether or not you're able to achieve those outcomes, the, the expectations of, and the desired outcomes that you've set for your, for your organization. So, um, you know, that, that's one example. And then there's other outcomes in terms of the effectiveness of your operational risk management program. So it's basically defining if, if we look at the, um, the loss events collection process, for example, is by clearly defining like what, what, what do we want to see? What, what information do we want to be collecting? Um, what type, how, how robust of a description of the root cause do we want to see? Is it just about ticking a box and classifying it as being caused by people or caused by process? Or do we want to see more, um, more information that's going to give more meaningful insights into those causal factors of those loss events? So it's not just about outcomes of um, how you can survive a risk event, but it's also talking about what are those outcomes of our operational risk management processes and our program processes um, that we want to see. So, so define those very clearly of what good looks like and then measure and, and test and review and challenge against those characteristics. Thank you. Um, I have the second question for Tracy. Who does OSFI believe is the global thought leader in operational resilience today? Wow, that's a loaded question. I'm not sure I'm in the best position to answer that on behalf of the entire organization. Um, there's definitely, you know, different uh, government organizations globally that are showing leadership in those areas, as well as industry organizations. Um, so I, I'm not going to uh, pinhole and uh, point out specifically. However, I would like to point out that I believe uh, with the industry organizations, and the collaboration across governments, OSFI is in a very good position to uh, bring the appropriate leadership and tone for the Canadian financial industry. Thank you, Tracy. I have a third question for Catherine. You mentioned nimbleness in operational risk management teams to face pandemic response. 
can you please highlight the top two to three developments noted in your clients? Sure. Um, so in from a from a what's worked really effectively is those organizations that have invested recently in advanced analytics. So um, within their operational risk management programs have had uh, they've shared with us that they've ha been able to provide more meaningful information, timely information up to the senior executive to make um, good decisions or more informed decisions uh, compared to when they, they didn't have this type of information. And where they're, in, where they're performing this advanced analytics is they're, they're collecting data that's not just collected within the ops risk program itself, but there's a sharing of data across uh, the other pillars, including compliance and internal audit and uh, finance, even financial governance. And they're, they're looking, they're analyzing this information to be able to identify um, relationships and correlations across their uh, controls and processes and infrastructure, uh, but they're also looking to see uh, whether, whether the relationships across the different elements of risk and the different drivers of risk. So this, uh, uh, the development of advanced analytics being used in operational risk management, which, which is still fairly um, new, it's being used in financial risk side uh, for many, many years now. This has been a, a development that has actually really um, fair, helped organizations and some of our clients uh, have better information that's being taken up to the senior executive level and board to make some of these strategic decisions um, using having more information at their fingertips. I say the other, uh, you know, in order for these organizations to be more nimble is that from a culture standpoint, uh, um, we've seen some clients where their response was not as coordinated. There were some um, miscues in terms of who's supposed to be uh, doing what. Uh, there were some organizations that didn't have laptops for all of their employees within the, the function. Um, organizations that uh, in terms of things to their measurement or getting assurance that the culture is sound um, have actually have seen good results. Thank okay. you, Karen. And I think we'll have to we'll have to move on now. So any of the other questions, we will uh, send answers by email over the next few days. So now I'd like to introduce David Correa, our director in our accounting division, who is going to be talking about IFRS 17, and also Thomas Sarazen, a director in our capital insurance division, who will be talk giving an update on on LICAT. So I'm now going to turn it over to David. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, good morning. Uh, I am the OSFI for 17 project lead. And the goal of this presentation is to have a dialogue on uh, IFRS 17, its activities that impact your project. So the first slide, um, let's move to the first slide. So we went out to the industry and we asked the industry to have a dialogue. We asked them questions. We asked them to give us questions and see, see these questions. The first three questions re relate to pre-flight activities. What are the things that OSFI is impacting? How is it OSFI impacting your project preparing for the transition? So the first question is, how, when will OSFI relaunch the next progress report? Will OSFI issue new IFR 17, IFR 9 advisory? Will there be new accounting policy restrictions? And the third question, what is OSFI's view of the range of practice, discount rates, having a potential material impact on the capital of companies? So these are pre-transition questions. And the next slide deals with post or in-flight uh, monitoring of IFRS 17. The fourth question was, what is the planned timing scope of the new performance metrics? And the fifth question was, how will OSFI know that like at IFRS 17 framework is right. There are many changes happening. How do we get comfortable that the framework is appropriate, fit for purpose? So let's go to the, the, the next slide. And so this is our timeline. So the timeline uh, you probably are used to, uh, not much has changed. The runway has been expanded by a year. Uh, we have accounting policy uh, that we look at, transition support items, uh, like actual application guide and capital. Those three streams have stayed the same. The inputs, the outputs have stayed the same. The runway has been extended. We lost six months because of COVID. However, uh, we the ISB gave us an additional year. So effectively, we have another six months to this project. 
And uh, that was, we were capable to, to manage uh, COVID be because of the ISB extension. So the next slide, this talks about the progress report. So we, we um, decided to stop the progress report requirement in March, uh, suspend it, uh, and uh, now the next progress report is due in September, and we've taken a simplified path to that progress report. So what that means is no quants. We've decided that we're not going to request that we'll have a, 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 a we'll slowly go up to where we were before and not require any quantitative numbers in September. We'll have a self-assessment questionnaire. We'll want to understand, the supervisor will want to understand how much time was lost and how you're going to make up that time because of COVID and how you're going to uh, adjust your projects to deal with COVID-19. So that's the progress report. Uh, your lead supervisor are going to send you details of the request um, and the template in July. Uh, following that, in October, uh, your lead supervisors are going to make a request, a quant request, and that is to support the work that is being done on the quiz, the actual analysis, and the supervision metrics and tools. So instead of asking for it in July um, for a September delivery, we're asking for it in October for a December delivery, and it's a one office request. You're not going to get a number of requests. You're going to get a one office request, trying to reduce the burden to the industry. So let's go to the next slide, which is our second question. So is OSFI updating its advisories? So I have press 17 and 9. So the ISB issued some amendments to the standard that will be finalized in June, at the end of June. And, the, uh, and so will OSFI now add additional restrictions? The answer, simple answer is no. We are going to update the advisory, changing the effective date and adding four additional progress reports. So because the extended timeline has gone out now two years from 2021 now to 2023. So we'll add four additional progress reports and the date is the only thing that will be changing. Everything else will stay the same. So let's go to the next slide. And this slide is on IFRS 9. As you can see, it still will apply to life codes uh, and we want everybody to transition at the same point. So let's go to the next slide, which is the next question. Uh, so this is, uh, Aussie's view on the range of practice, such as discount rates. So we look at uh, we look at the discount rates and the range of actual practice uh, uh, critically. It is a very important. We have a robust frame. We feel that we have a robust framework. I think that I think internationally the industry feels that we have a robust framework. And so to maintain that framework. We, we need to have a consistent and comparable set of financial statements and a consistent and comparable set of financial statements means similar actuarial application approaches. Um, so this particular slide talks about discount rates. The CIA recently published an end note on it uh, and we would like the industry to follow this ed note and apply that, that guidance and so that we have a narrowing of the range. And if not, what will happen is OSFI will then do additional work in the fall of 2020 to, in order to understand the range of practice. So I encourage everyone to, to follow a narrow range of practice that we've done in the past because that simplifies things. It served us well in the past. Let's stay along that line uh, going forward. So the next slide talks about the, uh, this is the fourth question um, on metrics. So once we are live with IFRS 17, once we are in flight, uh, will OSFI be, have new metrics, new tools? And the simple answer to that is yes. Um, OSFI is working to revise its existing metrics and tools with the regulatory returns. So the regulatory returns uh, currently, there is a um, there is a uh, uh, we're consulting on the regulatory returns. There's currently out uh, out there for anybody to read on the website, and those regulatory returns will lead to new metrics and tools that uh, your supervisors will use on a quarterly basis for monitoring. So, the new financial statements disaggregate policyholder liabilities, as you know, risk adjustment (CSM) as an example. 
uh, provides roll, liability roll forwards. It splits out the income statement in a way that provides more tools for supervisors to understand the source of earnings. And so this will be used by your supervisors going forward. We are going to be testing some of the, these concepts, some of these ideas in 2021, developing, testing, um, and refining 2021, 2022, and then we'll be ready for 2023. So the next slide, this slide was a question on fit for purpose. Is like, at, are we comfortable with, how do we get comfortable with IFR 17 and our framework? Uh, and the simple answer is we do a lot of work, both in capital, actuarial, and accounting to understand the standard and its implications. So before we go out to industry, we do a full quant analysis and qualitative analysis of what the standard's gonna do to our framework. We did that back in 2017. We did it again with the amendments. Then we go out to the industry and we ask them questions, what didn't we see? We did that by having one-on-one -on -one meetings with the industry. We did that by having quizzes, the quiz number one, developing the LICAT. We do that by having progress reports. So we listen. Uh, to you. Uh, sometimes you feel we don't, but we actually do listen to the industry. We, we receive your feedback. We go back and we look at what did we miss something? Do we not understand something? We test it and then we go back again. And that's why you have a quiz number one, two, three, test run. Uh, and, and that's how we get comfortable that we are on a good footing for the transition and then post transition. And so then the, I think this is it, and now I'll turn it over, I think this is my last slide, and now I'll turn, turn it over to Thomas uh, for a discussion on LICAT, and then I'll still be around for questions later. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you everyone for dialing into this WestCAF today. Um, my name is Thomas Sarazin, and I'm a director in OSFI's uh, capital division. Today, what I want to do is provide you an update on regulatory capital for life insurers. Uh, my focus will be on the adjustments that we were making to the life insurance capital test for the IFRS 17 standard, uh, but I will provide uh, updates in other areas as well. Next slide, please. So let's start with like at under IFRS 17. Uh, Aussie fully supports um, the implementation of the International Financial Reporting Standard 17 for insurance contract uh, valuations. Accordingly, and from a capital perspective, um, we are looking or revising the LICAT to uh, make sure that the test is adaptable to that new standard, as well as um, to the extent that it's prudently uh, possible, um, maintain current policy or regulatory capital policy to make sure that uh, on an industry basis, or to minimize on an industry basis the capital impacts. One good example of the latter is uh, treatment of the uh, contractual service margin or the CSM. Um, here, what we intend to do is to um, make the CSM an element of regulatory capital um, identical to its treatment uh, today, which is currently under the, the banner of uh, retained earnings. Now that said, I should also mention that um, the LICAT will continue to be based on accounting standards. Um, more specifically, um, insurers shouldn't expect that we are going to include adjustments or revisions to the test um, to override the accounting standards, uh, especially when it comes to or for the purposes of uh, mitigating capital impacts. Next slide, please. So. In June 2019, uh, we drafted um, and then conducted and consulted on a first version of uh, the LICAT under, under IFRS 17. Um, the testing was done on a best efforts basis because final accounting policies and uh, completely complete CIA guidance wasn't available at time. Um, quantitatively, um, on an industry average basis, uh, we observed that the LICAT ratio is decreased relative to um, the current ratios under the current approach. For LIMAT, which represents the foreign, uh, foreign industry, foreign insure industry, uh, the LICAT remained relatively uh, stable under the new approach. Next slide, please. 
The drivers on a total industry basis of these results are uh, one, mainly the combination of uh, lower discount rates under the IFRS 17 standard vis-a-vis -vis the current COM approach uh, in combination with an elim elimination of the in, uh, economic risk PFATs. Together, both those elements uh, brought the uh, LICAT ratios down. Another very important um, uh, driver of the results were uh, the fact that uh, we moved from a negative reserve uh, or we moved from a padded uh, approach for capital requirements for negative reserves to a best estimate basis. Uh, that also brought down the ratio of um, the industry on an uh, on a average basis. Uh, another noteworthy item is that all other capital requirements, um, i.e. the BSB or the base solvency buffer, um, suffered a very um, minor increase on an industry average basis, which we're uh, very encouraged with in this first round of testing. Next slide, please. Now, what I'd want to do is to go over a few of the um, few of the items that are currently under review for for the LICAT um, as a result of the um, the comments and the feedback that we received from uh, the testing last June. For negative reserve, when we switch from um, a padded approach to best estimate approach, we understood that that would uh, have a downward impact on the um, on the ratios. Now, because there was room to do so, we reviewed the um, level and trend component which offsets this requirement upwards to make to for the purposes of making uh, the or neutralizing the the change from the best estimate uh, or to the best estimate approach um, what we realized from the quiz results is that um, that wasn't enough so what we're currently doing is conducting more analysis to see if we can further uh, refine the negative tr reserve treatment approach um, for, for the future version of uh, the uh, draft LICAT. We also received comments on, uh, from industry on uh, the uh, determination of credit and market risk capital requirements uh, based by currency. The main concern there was that um, the um, approach that we were taking under this draft was not aligned to the um, necessary line to risk management processes of the insurers. We understand this comment and uh, like the negative reserve treatment are uh, conducting further analysis to see if there's a further refinements we can make to, to this approach. Next slide please. Um, and finally, under unregistered reinsurance, um, similar to negative reserve, we move for, to a best estimate approach for, for the requirements of these exposures. Um, the way we went by or the approach that we took to make this change, um, industry commented that it was complicated and uh, difficult to follow. Uh, Accordingly, we've made significant revisions to the approach uh, to make sure that the calculation and the understanding of the requirements for insurers are much simpler and clearer. Um, I've noted down another uh, issue under review, uh, but in the interest of time, uh, I'll skip that for now, but happy to take questions uh, on, on it um, during the Q&A period. Next slide, please. So uh, as David mentioned, we, we reviewed our timelines um, for the uh, next steps for the development of LICAT under IFRS 17 due to uh, the two significant events, uh, namely the deferral of, of uh, implementation of IFRS 17 from 2022 to 2023 and the suspension of our um, consultations in March. Now, at this point, uh, we expect that the first version of the IF, uh, LICAT under IFRS 17 to be implemented as of January 1st, 2023. In this slide, I've included um, the uh, expected milestones and the approach that we'll take uh, to reach that target of the 2023 uh, timeline. Um, in more in the near term, um, i.e. in October of 2023, um, we are planning a consultation and a second QIS on a second version of the draft LICAT under IFRS 17. The focus of this uh, QIS and consultation will be on the numerator of, of the ratios and uh, will include focus on tier one, tier two, and other elements of, um, of the numerator. Um, the BSB, or the capital requirements, the cash calculation of that measure will be optional. 
uh, but insurers are, are invited to, to uh, complete that uh, testing if they wish to do so. Um, lastly, I'll mention that the, this part of this quiz, there will be sensitivity uh, testing, um, again, mostly focused on the numerator of the, uh, of the LICAT ratios. Next slide, please. I want, quickly want to touch on two other uh, topics uh, in respect to the LICAT. Uh, the first one being the implications of the COVID-19 related um, crisis. Um, overall, I'm very happy to report that the LICAT performed as expected. Uh, despite that, we did make some um, adjustments to the test to reflect very specific circumstances that uh, arose from the crisis. The first one uh, is related to assets where payments were deferred as a result of uh, COVID-19 implications. Here, we maintain the capital level for those assets um, as opposed to um, making it or leaving it uh, the treatment uh, stable where we could have seen potentially uh, an increase in the capital requirements uh, based on the fact that these assets might have been treated as non-performing. We also, uh, we also smooth or introduced a smoothing mechanism for interest rates risk capital requirements. Uh, the purpose of doing that was to address previously identified volatility or unwarranted volatility in the requirements that we think might have been exacerbated uh, by the COVID-19 implications. At this time, we're not planning any more um, any more uh, revisions to the test, and we're starting to turn our attention to the lifespan of both of these uh, adjustments. Next slide, please. And finally, but certainly not least, um, I want to provide an update on the uh, development of the standard approach for calculation of segregated fund guarantee um, capital requirements. Currently, we are reviewing the quiz three results. Um, the results were submitted to us at the middle of June, or in the middle of June, following uh, industry feedback that they were in a position to provide these results, uh, despite the consultation being um, uh, put on hold. Um, so we're, we're reviewing those results, um, and in tandem, uh, similar to what we were doing for the LICAT, we're reviewing the timelines for the development of the standard, and the industry should expect updates in the coming months. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to um, Elspeth. Thank you, uh, Thomas and David, for um, some informative uh, discussion. And I'll now see if there are any questions from our viewers. Do yes. Yes, we, we have received a couple questions. The first one is for Thomas. Uh, why not allow CSM or risk adjustment offsets to negative reserves under IFRS 17 LICAT? Um, for the IFRS 17 LICAT, the, the treatment of CSM is um, already included in the, um, in the uh, component of available capital. Um, so there is a, um, a, a sort of, um, or already an inclusion for that element in available capital. Um, for negative reserves, we already do have offsets um, that I was currently uh, previously mentioning. Uh, for those offsets, what uh, as I was just saying earlier, uh, we're conducting a little bit more analysis to see if there's um, any more um, possibilities or options where we could adjust them um, in, for the next version of the, uh, the draft LICAT. And another question uh, for Thomas as well. Uh, how does the elimination of economic risk PFADs reduce the LICAT ratios? Shouldn't it be just a switch from the surplus allowance to retained earnings? Good question. Um, the previous um, version of the, or the current version and the next version of the LICAT has a component of surplus allowance. Uh, therefore, if um, you are um, eliminating some um, PFADs or risk adjustments in this case on the whole, uh, while you're um, reducing overall your retained earnings, you're no longer eligible to include these PFADs because they've been eliminated in the surplus allowance. So as a combination of both those items with the lower discount rate, uh, you um, suffer a decrease in your um, core and total capital ratios. Do we have any other questions? Or yes. is that uh, we have received uh, a, another question, which is more general. 
uh, when will OSFI unwind the COVID-19 measure related to loans and premium deferral? I think so. that one's for Thomas, probably. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, right now we're, there are no explicit plans or uh, um, plans that I can share in terms of uh, unwinding the measures. But certainly as uh, we progress uh, through, this, uh, through this event, uh, we are now turning our attention to, to looking at the, the lifespan of the, both the, um, the uh, adjustments that we've made under the LICAT and elsewhere um, for other capital tests. Um, but no plans have been um, made yet as to when that will, uh, will occur. Okay, and if we have any other questions, we have time for one more question. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, can you provide uh, more details on what is requested by the upcoming keys, quiz exercise? Uh, what specific areas to focus? And David, do you want to start with that one? Uh, so, uh, so OSFI will issue one uh, set of requirements. Effectively, it's an IFRS 4 2019 balance sheet versus an IFRS 17 pro forma balance sheet, uh, and then uh, have reconciliations on retained earnings, uh, liability roll forwards, uh, so we can understand the component parts of the numerator for the test. So for the capital quiz, and then there will be some capital quiz questions that Thomas alluded to, and, and then we'll also use that same data set, that same pro forma uh, balance sheet for actuarial analysis of the movement, for example, on discount rates, and also use that to, to, to drive our metrics and tools. Okay, thank you, um, David. And we, I think it's time that we move on to our final session where we're going to discuss OSFI's plans and priorities for the next two to three years. I'd like to introduce our group of speakers. First, we have Warren Rodericks, Manage, Managing Director in our Actuarial Division. Annie Stewart, Managing Director in our Culture, Conduct and Risk Division. Mohammed al Bustami, Managing Director in our Technology Risk Division. Stefan Tardif, Managing Director in our Property and Casualty Insurance Group. And finally, Velasius Mel Melissa Saxonakis, Director in our Prudential Policy Strate and Strategic Liaison Group. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Warren. Thanks, Elspeth. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, okay, good. Um, hello, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing well, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Warren Rodericks, and I work in the actuarial division within insurance supervision. I just wanted to provide what should be a quick update on four ongoing activities of the actuarial division. So regarding the first activity, COVID-19 related work, uh, the actuarial division performed a variety of analysis of life insurance companies looking at things like equity exposures, interest rate sensitivities, lapses, liquidity, and mortality. Um, we were able to use information that we had already had available from various sources, uh, for example, quarterly submissions or information submitted in the last IFRS 17 quiz. So although the work was quite high level, uh, we didn't need to go to the industry with additional data requests. Uh, we didn't identify any specific red flags from the work, uh, and that was a good thing. And indeed, our attention was also focused uh, these days on uh, PNC and mortgage insurers with specific issues in those industries as well. So we will continue to monitor and add to the analysis we are performing throughout the year and beyond. And this is also in addition to our usual quarterly monitoring process. Uh, regarding the second item, IFRS 17 actuarial quiz, this is the part of the recent IFRS 17 quiz that's already been discussed by my colleagues that belonged to the actuarial division uh, that related more specifically to actuarial reserves and assumptions under IFRS 17. So uh, in, note, in looking at the quiz results, we observed that there was a fairly wide range of practice uh, as some of my colleagues have already alluded to earlier, uh, particularly with respect to discount rates. So I qualify these observations by noting a few things. First, as was already pointed out, the CIA educational note on discount rates was not widely available 
when the quiz was issued. Uh, second, we already knew that a number of companies through discussions with them had not come to finalization of all of their accounting policies. And lastly, OSFI issued the quiz on a best efforts basis. So in light of all of that, we decided that we wouldn't read too much into the observed wide range of practice. Um, however, we are currently planning for the next quiz scheduled for this fall sometime. And the actuarial portion of that quiz will focus mainly on, on discount rates again. And we will more closely observe the range of practice, particularly given that the CIA draft educational note on discount rates is now in circulation. Regarding the third item, the participating insurance project, uh, as a reminder, this is a project that is looking at participating insurance practices across the industry. Over the last few months, we have collected information from a number of companies on their participating insurance policies, processes, and disclosures. Uh, we are still in the process of summarizing that information with an analysis coming in the near future. And some possible outcomes of this project could be adjustments to information collected in the appointed actuaries report. Uh, or possibly, and or possibly uh, updates to OSFI guideline E16. So there should be more to come on this in the future. Uh, lastly, the last item, segregated fund model project. Uh, we have a plan to put together our own IFRS 17 um, guarantee fund valuation model. And we will be um, using this as a tool in our supervision work. Our project plan includes obtaining a professional services firm to help with the determination of the market consistent valuation to help lend some industry credibility to our model. And we are just now in the process of finalizing the selection of that, of, of that firm. Uh, after that, throughout the remainder of this year, we're gonna focus on building the building phase of that model, as well as uh, you know, determining what, we, what our interpretation of the market consistent valuation should be. So, that's all I have for now from Actuarial Division. Thank you for listening. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to Annie. Thank you. I hope you and your families are all doing well. My name is Annie Stewart. I'm the Managing Director of the Culture and Conduct Risk Division at OSFI. I'm going to speak to you about the work that we've done to date on culture and where we're headed in terms of supervision. Next slide, please. Why is culture important? I can tell you that the pandemic has brought the reason of why to life. Uh, all of you have been looking at attitudes towards working from home and how to communicate effectively. You've been using words like resilience and agility. As COVID-19 has brought on global disruption and economic uncertainty, culture at work has never been more important. Let's look at OSFI's journey. How did we get here? Next slide, please. In the past, OSFI has more narrowly focused on culture as it relates to risk appetite. We've looked at how risk appetite has informed decisions and behaviors within the institution. For example, in the area of compensation. And that work will continue as a strategic priority, we're adopting more insightful and effective approaches to culture in order to advance this work. Next slide, please. Today, the Culture and Conduct Risk Division is comprised of the former Corporate Governance Division, which had led much of this work, in addition to the AML and Compliance Group combined. In 2019, we completed an industry culture scan. This was an information gathering exercise across insurance and banking with institutions of various size. And this was foundational to understand the range of practice for insights into FERFI or federally regulated financial institution, governance, promotion, and self-assessment of culture. Feedback from the scan was shared directly with the participants. And in terms of general themes, we found that there was no significant difference between insurance and banking in practice. There were some differences between large and small institutions. Board discussions on culture 
are incidental to other agenda items. It has not been a topic of focus. Variety of tools and techniques are used to promote culture. And human resources was cited by the majority as having the key role in promoting culture throughout the employee life cycle, along with compliance and risk management. Internal audit has developed its practice in this area, and a few large institutions have conducted culture-specific audits. We found that regular employee engagement survey is the primary monitoring tool. Assessing and measuring culture continues to be a challenge. No single metric is able to capture it. Uh, institutions took a multifaceted approach to measure elements of culture. And larger institutions tend to cite a broader range of metrics using data across HR, control functions, and customer sentiment or satisfaction data. What are OSFI's next steps in the short term and in the long term? Next slide, please. In the short term, to evolve our supervisory practices, we've added behavioral science expertise to the team. This is meant to enhance our ability to assess culture and drivers of behaviors. With the help of industrial psychologists, um, individuals that have experience in culture transformation and socioanthropology. We've established an external advisory committee for practical guidance. This committee not only consists of retired financial industry leaders and board members, we've also invited leaders from other industries with a focus on safety culture and risk management. In the long term, we've commenced culture-focused supervisory reviews, commencing with decision-making. We're not only looking at the process, but we're looking at the underlying dynamics in reaching those strategic decisions. Uh, this review work was temporarily paused as we shifted to monitoring activities in response to COVID-19. And we're taking the opportunity to enhance our methodology with the benefit of the behavioral scientists. The pandemic response will inform our future review work. I can tell you that institutions have adapted their governance and decision-making processes at this time for greater agility and responsiveness in their operations. Coming out of the pandemic, we have a unique opportunity to look at FERFI culture and behavior in a time of heightened and sustained stress. We will also be interested in looking at your change management practices. So I'll leave you with the question of what will your culture look like in the post pandemic world? What will you do to shape the culture going forward? And so that brings us to the end of the presentation and I will pass the mic to Mo in Technology Risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie, and good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay, and I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy uh, in these current uh, times. Uh, my name is Mohamed Al-Bustami, or Mo. I'm the Managing Director of the Technology Risk Division at OSFI, and I will be talking to you today a little bit about the Technology Risk Division, some of the stuff we've been doing and what do we have planned uh, for the upcoming months. Um, I'll start by saying that Technology Risk Division is a newly formed division. We celebrated our first birthday just uh, less than a month ago. Um, and uh, while the first year was very focused on the human element, you know, I, I'm happy to, to say that we grew when, when I joined, uh, we grew from uh, about three or four individual to now uh, double digits, so which kind of help us a lot to focus uh, on delivering our mandate. So if we look at the high level agenda that we're going to be talking on today in the next slide, we're just going to talk, uh, give a brief introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about cyber risk and technology risk. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about third party risk. 
Uh, and going back, as I mentioned, uh, you know, this year hopefully will be able uh, will enable us to focus on our mandate, uh, and that's on the next slide. Um, and I'm not going to go through the full mandate in uh, word by word. It's a bit of a lengthy mandate, but I did that intentionally to try to demystify a little bit of elements when people hear technology risk or what does that encompass. And you probably can uh, focus that in the bottom uh, half of the mandate uh, when, uh, if I read it to you, uh, it says, an in-depth understanding and assessment of threats to any process or function that involves system data, infrastructure, network, cybersecurity, and digital technology impacting our institutions. So then that drives the question is how we're gonna deliver on that mandate. And the next slide highlights four pillars that uh, I will be uh, talking a little bit about two of them. I'm not gonna have the time to cover all of those pillars, uh, but I'll probably uh, touch uh, on the cyber risk intelligent response and uh, a, a little bit on our monitoring and review work. Uh, and if I start with the first one around cyber uh, risk intelligent response, uh, a lot of you are familiar uh, early last year, in, around March in 2019, uh, OSFI came out with an incident uh, notification advisory, uh, technology and cyber incident notification advisory. Uh, and uh, while this was great because it will help us keep uh, our hands close to the pulse of what kind of incident happened, um, it started us thinking on what can we do with some of that data. So on the next slide, if you if you look at some of the elements we, we wanted to kind of look at is uh, how can we leverage some of the incident data that we receive from our institution to help us better protect the overall industry. So we started thinking of uh, pushing out what we call intelligence bulletins uh, that basically collect some information based on the information we get uh, uh, on the incident advisory, uh, try to enrich it a little bit, uh, utilizing some of our partners within the, within the uh, governmental agency uh, like the Cyber Center, and push out intelligence bulletin, you know, maintaining the confidentiality of our institution, of course, and more focused on the techniques, tactics, and procedures that uh, attackers would use to do some of these incidents. Uh, we pushed the first one out back in August on the back of the publicly known incident that affected Capital One. Uh, since then, we released a couple more. One was around ransomware, which is continues to be very topical to this date. Uh, and we sent one out uh, around uh, Citrix vulnerability and remote uh, uh, VPN access, which again is very topical in the crisis uh, currently uh, that we're going through. Uh, but what we wanted also to do more is to start looking at how can we do uh, or utilize this data to do more trending. So the next slide can give you a little bit of, of a, a teaser or some of the uh, capabilities or things that we want to start doing while uh, with the data that we receive, how we look at the, the, the incidents that we're receiving in terms of, uh, is this an account takeover or is it a third party breach or is it a data breach or is it a technology outage? And you start seeing some interesting themes and highlights from this data like, oh, well actually, you know, technology outage makes a lot of the you know or majority of the incident of last year uh you know account takeover started strong in the beginning two quarters of 2019 but then disappeared but then started making a comeback well what why and what kind of techniques has changed or were they uh were they targeting some other targets so this is something we want to start working on and hopefully you know in the near future we can push out some more information related to what have we seen uh, let's say uh, across the industry in terms of uh, incidents and 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 some lessons learned uh, but one thing to to highlight here which kind of will be a nice segue into the next topic is again one of the the the, the buckets or uh, or the or the incident type we focus on is third party breaches and we notice that actually it is kind of basically tied as uh, you know, the, basically the top uh, type of incident that we've been collecting for the past uh, few quarters. Uh, and this ties in nicely uh, as we start talking to the next slide about some of the work we did around third party risk. Um, and this is uh, a work that we started again early last year around February. We selected a number of uh, institutions to uh, take part of a third party risk management uh, questionnaire. And I would take this time now to thank everyone who took part of this uh, questionnaire uh, and 
after that, uh, in the summer months, around August, September, we even selected a subgroup of those institutions uh, to do a focus study uh, that we wanted to, again, gather additional information that will help us to look at some of the practices around third-party risk management across uh, the industry. Uh, and we were, uh, you know, I'm, I would say I'm, I'm happy to report that we were able finally to uh, uh, push out a report to the at least the institution that took part of that study uh, just earlier this month, highlighting a few focus areas uh, around, you know, risk assessment, uh, around uh, cloud computing. This is, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the next slide, of course. Uh, uh, so, you know, it, we focused on areas like uh, management of cloud services, management of um, extensive use of third party, high risk providers. Uh, we looked at areas like data security and access, continuity of critical operations, uh, monitoring and incident management. Um, and while, uh, you know, we, we, I would say we're trying to actually come up with a public version that we can push out to the public because uh, we believe there's a lot of interesting content there that it would be beneficial to guide a lot of conversation within our institution. So I would say stay tuned. Uh, my colleague Flazi is going to talk a little bit about the upcoming technology uh, risk discussion paper, which would include some of those uh, highlights, but, and, and we were looking to probably uh, publish something publicly around the, uh, the third-party risk management work uh, that will coincide with the publication of the technology risk division. Um, and finally, I will close with some of the stuff that we want to continue doing or want to move forward as we continue building our team. Uh, we want to continue developing and enhancing uh, our mandate and guidance. Uh, we will be looking to continue hopefully pushing those intelligence uh, bulletin uh, in a timely and actionable manner. Uh, also, we started pushing out what we call technology risk bulletin, which are focused on um, you know, teething technology problems. We pushed, we, we, we pushed the first one also earlier this month, which was focused on authentication. Again, it's a timely uh, topic, uh, taking uh, into consideration the crisis we're going on and, and, and the move to uh, a lot of services to online uh, uh, type services and, and ensuring that uh, proper authentication practices uh, are enforced. And with that, I will end and pass it on to my colleague, Stefan. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, Mo. Um, my name is Stéphane Tardif. I'm a managing director in the Property and Casualty Insurance Group. I'm also responsible for OSFI's uh, climate change uh, working group. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? I'm very happy to have been invited for a second year in a row. I first uh, presented to the Life uh, Risk Management Seminar last year. Um, last year, I mentioned to many of you that we had just uh, created this climate change working group across OSFI, across all disciplines and across all industries. Uh, and uh, we had just formed it and we had also just joined the Sustainable Insurance Forum and we were just undertaking some benchmarking uh, studies and some we had uh, done a number of uh, surveys. Uh, so I'm really happy to be back here today, a year later, uh, just to provide a quick update on our work to date and what's uh, what's uh, being planned for, for uh, the year ahead. Uh, on the working uh, group, we're committed to ensuring that, you know, our expectations are clearly communicated to all of our furfies, uh, that, our, that institutions remain uh, well prepared uh, to address climate risks, um, and also internally that our staff uh, are properly prepared and trained um, to uh, include climate risks in our risk assessment work and that they understand uh, the metrics and the exposures and the risk management practices around climate risk. So those, those remain uh, our key objectives for the working group uh, this year. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of what's happened since I last updated uh, the life insurance uh, group, um, just uh, probably a couple of months ago, uh, OSFI joined the Basel Committee uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the BCBS, Task Force on Climate Change Related Financial Risks. Uh, and this is really interesting, uh, maybe not interesting from a life perspective, but for OSFI, it gives us now broad coverage across both, both sectors. Uh, we were quite active on the international insurance front with our work on the IIS and the Sustainable Insurance Forum, but felt there was a little bit of a, a lack of coverage on the banking 
so we're very pleased that the BCBS has created that task force and we have uh, membership and participation on, on that group. We're also working uh, very closely with our regulation sector uh, colleagues, and uh, Vlasios will speak a little bit to this after me, to uh, publish a discussion paper. Uh, it was scheduled for uh, the fall of this year, November of this year. And this is a, a public uh, consultation discussion paper on our expectations around climate risk management. Um, we probably lost a couple of months uh, because of COVID. So there's a chance it may be delayed to January, February, but we're really pushing hard to get it out uh, in this, this calendar year. And uh, this will be open uh, for public consultations and uh, we'll, there'll be a lot of activity surrounding uh, that paper. We're also continuing to contr contribute to uh, the IIS and the Sustainable Insurance Forum. Uh, you may have noticed, for some of you who follow those, uh, that um, the questions bank, there was a question bank that was published uh, earlier this year. And uh, we also, the IS also published um, a paper uh, where we contributed data on uh, Canadian insurers' adoption of the TCFD. So those are two interesting papers if you haven't had a chance to read them. And uh, right now, Neville, and, uh, Neville Henderson and myself are on the drafting team. Uh, with the IIS working on a new application paper uh, with regards to climate risks and how they relate to the ICPs. And this paper is scheduled to be published in November 2020. And I think the public consultation will be in, a, in about a month or so uh, on that paper. So there's a, a, not, a lot of work happening uh, on that front. Domestically, uh, we've also started to collaborate uh, with the Bank of Canada, one of our FISC partners, yeah, we're working on a, uh, a, a pilot with the banks and insurance companies, uh, which is going to start very shortly and looking at data gaps uh, in terms of developing a stress test or scenario analysis for 2021. So uh, just in conclusion, uh, for the work for 2021 is really focused on uh, the discussion paper in terms of clarifying our expectations, uh, continuing with our benchmarking, uh, qualitative and quantitative assessments and uh, continue with our communication activities, both domestically and internationally. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to Vlasios, uh, who's going to speak to our Prudential Policy Initiatives uh, more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to all of you today. Uh, my name is Vlasios Melisanakis, and I lead the team that is responsible for uh, broader policy initiatives uh, on the part of OSFI, uh, but also risk management guidelines, essentially guidelines that don't relate to capital, accounting, or actuarial. Um, as you know, um, in a recent statement uh, by the, um, uh, I believe it was a superintendent, an OSFI-wide statement, next slide, please. Um, we suspended all of our policy development uh, in mid-March and all of our corresponding consultation processes. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, when is it time to sort of relaunch all of our, uh, all of our policy? Uh, at the moment, we are um, meeting with a variety of stakeholders, uh, talking with them uh, from industry, industry associations, individual companies, just to sort of understand uh, you know, if they would be prepared uh, to, to undertake the work uh, that we have planned. And in, in that regard, you know, we want to launch our, relaunch our policy work with essentially three principles in mind. First of all, uh, anything we do obviously has to be relevant, uh, continue to be relevant uh, to our strategic goals. Uh, notably our goal, goal one and goal two, with respect to financial risk and non-financial risk. Um, it would need to be responsive. Uh, you know, we recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty still um, in, the, in the current environment. Uh, and so we need to be flexible uh, in deploying our resources to a lot of these policy initiatives. Um, and, but yet we need to also, uh, you know, address the, the prudential concerns or risks that are out there. Uh, and so it is a bit about striking an appropriate balance. Uh, and finally, it needs to be realistic. Uh, you know, we need to take into account the operational constraints, uh, that we all face, OSFI, as well as the industry with respect to sort of the public health, 
concerns and the rules uh, that sort of dictate our work these days. Um, and so what that means is that this will entail a bit of reprioritizing of policy initiatives and projects. Um, and if we are to relaunch, we would need to do so in a bit of a staggered manner so that we do not overwhelm the industry. Um, and uh, always with the, um, uh, with the ability to change our timelines if needed, even if we're mid course. So um, with that, I'll talk a little bit about the, the policy initiatives and, and where they stand. Um, I should note that any dates that I am quoting here um, are really tentative, uh, given what I, what I just said about uh, the three principles that we're trying to apply. Next slide. Uh, so Mo already uh, talked a little bit about um, you know, the publication of a technology risk discussion paper. And just a little bit of background on this. Um, in Ottawa, we, uh, we have this term, it's called a green paper. Um, and a green paper is one that is high level, uh, does not put forward any specific policy recommendations, but is really designed to kickstart the discussion. Um, and so the paper that we have planned, and at this point, this paper will likely be the first one out of the gate uh, that we share with the public and the industry. And so right now we are targeting September, October at the latest for the publication of, of this paper. Now, while it's very high level, it will cover off a number of topics, um, all of which touch upon technology, cybersecurity, advanced analytics, and artificial intelligence, third-party providers, uh, data, among other, uh, among other topics. So it's wide-ranging, but yet uh, very high level. Um, the next initiative is a guideline E4, and in the insurance uh, uh, case, it would be E4A, the role of the chief agent. This has been an initiative that uh, was put on hold a couple of years ago uh, because of the corporate governance guideline um, project. We completed that project and we were prepared to issue a revised guideline um, in the spring, just before the uh, the crisis hit and of course everything got delayed because of the the crisis so um, this is long overdue and we're now ready to share a draft uh, of the guideline with the industry um, this guideline is a little different than the current e4a first of all the focus will be on the foreign entity itself it'll be on the branch the requirements of the foreign entity and will not focus on the role of the chief agent. Um, in fact, this, this guideline will be uh, very much uh, principles-based, um, significantly streamlined from uh, the, the, the previous guideline, and will in fact consolidate the requirements for both bank branches and insurance branches into one guideline on branches uh, and, and the principles that would apply. If you recall the corporate governance initiative where we sort of streamlined it, made it principles-based, outcomes-based, um, this is sort of the equivalent initiative for the branches and we're trying to do the, the same thing for, for, for this guideline. What that means is that we are also going to consolidate all the requirements. So any requirements or references that now refer to the you know, the chief agent or branches in other OSFI guidance, we're going to delete all those references, at least that's what we're proposing, and to have it all in, in one guideline, a one-stop shop sort of approach. Um, and finally, what we want to include in this guideline is uh, a, an update uh, to reflect the Canada-US-Mexico agreement, specifically in regards to uh, record retention. And so that update will be uh, in this draft guideline. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, and then we have a couple of initiatives that are really planned for 2021. The first one is early 2021, as uh, Stefan mentioned, uh, you know, at this point, this is the climate risk discussion paper. Um, and the climate risk discussion paper 
is just that. It is, again, another green paper, as I call the technology paper. It's green. It's high level. It's there to kickstart the discussion. Um, we were hoping to release it in October, November, uh, but now it is looking more likely that it will be uh, issued in, in January, um, probably one of the first ones uh, in the new year. And then finally, uh, for the life industry, very important is the the reinsurance review, specifically guideline B3. Um, now, we've already consulted on a draft guideline um, and received uh, valuable comments from the industry uh, on, that, on that draft. Um, however, we won't be issuing final B3 until, um, until 2021, probably mid-2021, uh, and that's because we want to complete our work in a number of other areas in reinsurance, and some of it relates to the P&C industry. But we want to bring it all together, wrap it all up, uh, and present one cohesive, comprehensive reinsurance regime uh, at the end of it all. And so B3 um, will be delayed a bit, uh, but will come out in, uh, in 2021. And with that, I will pass it back to Elspeth. Well, thank you. Uh everybody for uh, some informative presentations. I'm now gonna see if we have any questions from our viewers. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, Elspeth, we have some questions. The first question is for Warren. Will the IFRS 17 SAG fund model just be an internal tool for OSFI or replace the current factor method available to companies? Okay, uh, thanks for that question. It will not be used to replace the current factor model. It will in fact just be an internal model used for benchmarking tools and for supervision purposes only. So. Thank you. The next question is for Mo. Who receives the bulletins and are they available on OSFI's website? Um, so the bulletins are actually directly sent to uh, the institution through our lead supervisors team. Uh, we usually try to target uh, individuals that are the heads of technology, uh, the chief information security officers, CIOs, uh, and and uh, people who will be you know using that information in these kind of bu bulletins. Uh, at this stage, we're not uh, putting those bulletins on the website due to some of the sensitivity and 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 some of the information there but it's something definitely we can take away and think about ways where we can uh, uh, put them on the website uh, maybe in the future. And thank you for that. Uh, the next question is for um, Actuarial, a question relating to DCAT or the new FCT, which was not mentioned in the actual update. Assuming we view the current COVID-19 crisis an extraordinary event, one in 150 or one in 100, a company's DCAT or, or, or FCT base case will already include the results of the event. Would it be OSFI's intention to apply a further one in 100 stress on the base case? How is OSFI, OSFI considering this? So that's a good question. It's something that we're actually considering internally. We do expect that the base scenario would incorporate the current environment and, and current expectations of of uh, future premiums, claims, et cetera. Um, as to whether the shocks would then consider further onerous um, uh, scenarios beyond that, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. I think it's difficult to say what from today, what a one in 100 would further look like from here, but we would expect to see something that is more onerous than the current uh, the, the, the current base scenario. I, I can't really give a better answer than that. It's something that we're still thinking on. Okay, the next question is for Annie. How do you feel that culture of an organization may change considering the new normal and potential for an increase in the work from home workforce? So what we've observed in moving to work from home is that institutions have relied on the past investments they've made in their culture, uh, leaning on strong working relationships and trust that has been built over time. Um, but we know now people are struggling to find balance. Um, workforces are grappling with personal lives, bleeding into their work environment. 
a lack of social interconnectedness and, of course, increased pressure on everyone's time. Uh, we're seeing fatigue, distraction, greater stress overall. And so um, I know that institutions are monitoring for this through employee pulse surveys, and there is an opportunity to assess or reassess and then think about reinventing their culture going forward. It will be a challenge, and I think as mentioned earlier, as we onboard new individuals, there need to be more creative and inventive ways in order to develop that culture going forward. Okay, the next question is for Warren. When is OSFI expected to provide further guidance on FCT 2020 due to COVID? Um, we hadn't contemplated providing any further guidance for the time being. Um, we, we expect this year because of the COVID environment that submissions might actually be a little bit late. I think the, the plan is to see what we get. Um, we're leaving it to the industry to decide how they're going to interpret the, the guidance and uh, from the CIA, the Ed note. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look and see what we get. And I think we'll react to it rather than um, decide what we exactly want to see right for the, for the current time. Um, it, going back to that previous question, it is, it, it, I think we're gonna have to leave it up to the industry to decide how onerous is onerous when they, um, are putting together and interpreting the FTT and the, and the, gui the guideline. Thank you, Warren. Uh, the next question for Mo. My company reported a cyber incident to our OSFI lead supervisor through our regular COVID updates. Do we still need to report this incident through the OSFI cyber incident reporting process? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, thank you for reporting it through your lead supervisor, but our uh, technology and cyber incident uh, reporting advisory uh, does state that you should be reporting it to both your LS, but also uh, through the advisory to the technology risk division mailbox. So we uh, ask all institution to do so uh, because that will just help us uh, in responding and, and managing expectation as it comes to those uh, incidents. Okay, the next question is for Vlasios. Why is the guideline B3 on reinsurance being delayed until mid next year? Okay, I can provide a bit more detail on that. So um, basically there's, uh, there's a couple of components that we're still working on to complete the reinsurance review. One of them actually relates to the PNC industry and it's guideline B2 on large exposures. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a guideline that we have not issued in draft form um, for consultation quite yet. We plan to do that uh, at some point in the fall, uh, at least tentatively, um, and we'd like to complete that process before we can put the finishing touches to guideline B3 on reinsurance. The, the two guidelines, in fact, speak to each other um, and uh, it's important for the PNC industry. Um, actually, there's another component. There's also the, the, the data, the information uh, with respect to the returns uh, when it relates to reinsurance. So that's another sort of uh, area that we want to make sure is complete. Uh, and then the idea is then to publish both guideline B2 for PNC uh, but also guideline B3, which applies to all insurance at the same time. Um, and then it'll be followed by industry sessions, uh, you know, on our overall reinsurance framework. So that's a, still a lot of work to be done. Um, and uh, we don't anticipate, that, and, and as such, it will sort of delay things a little bit. And we don't anticipate that that'll be out until probably spring or, or summer. 2021. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question if there's any other questions. Um, Warren, just to clarify, will OSPI be providing any extensions on FCT 2020? We're not going to provide, we're not going to officially provide extensions. We, um, I don't believe that we've communicated that we would, but I believe we are just anticipating that uh, FCT uh, submissions will 
come later than we expect um, because uh, because we, we've heard back from the industry that there are a number of things that are going on, but it wasn't included with the specific uh, exemptions that we've given for some of the other submissions. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And um, before I hand it over to Neville for closing remarks, I'd like to thank all of you for participating today. I hope you found it valuable. We will be sent, you will be receiving a short evaluation form later this afternoon. Um, and for, for your completion, we do value your comments. So we hope you will complete it. It helps us to continually improve. Um, if we haven't again had a chance to answer all your questions, we will be sending out written responses over the in the near term. And now I'll turn it over to Neville for closing remarks. Thank you, Elspeth. Uh, I, like you, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for their thoughtful and, and interesting insights on the various topics. Uh, effective supervision is, is really best accomplished when we can keep surprises to a minimum. Unfortunately, COVID struck quickly and we're all experiencing the somewhat chaotic consequences of a known risk becoming an immediate reality. My sense is that the industry in OSFI has developed reasonable and effective responses to the pandemic and that the learnings from this experience will form a basis for addressing future macro events. Uh, those future events could be a different type of pandemic or a major catastrophe and there are already known forces that could cause them and climate change is one of those. The only certainty is that there will be more of these challenging events in the future. This session has been important uh, for OSFI <clears throat> in sharing our, our priorities in, in the near to midterm future of our work. It's also important for us uh, to get your feedback on our priorities. It's in all of our interest to continue being risk aware, forward looking, and to share information on what our plans and actions are to address evolving risks. The nature of the pandemic and its implications on the issues mentioned earlier will require all of us to be resilient. How long the COVID part of the pandemic continues is yet to be seen, but the longer term implications on the economy are unknown and I suspect will continue for some time as well as create new challenges for all of us. I always enjoy these face-to-face -face interactions and, uh, that these seminars provide and it looks like this webinar format is going to be part of our collective uh, futures for some time. This is our first run at this format, so I look forward to reading your suggestions, suggestions on making the uh, process more effective, and I look forward to our future interactions. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>